Thank you very much. Now I would like to invite a uh, member of Knesset, Errol Margalit, from the Labour Party, to tell us a little bit more about the water cooperation and uh, in this region. Just before uh, we start with the presentation, just a quick remark for the session afterwards. When we go into the coffee break, please take all your belongings because the people in the conference going to uh, separate this room into two separate rooms. If, uh, I would like to make sure that no one loses anything. Thank you. Maybe I'll stand up from there. Can I Shalom, how are you guys? This was uh, one of the most impressive presentations that we just saw. Um, I salute the people who put the Gaza plan together. I have to say that I had some involvement primarily with the wish that a lot of the employment zones that Gaza is building will be built on the west side of Gaza, near Shal Negev, Zdevot, and um, the Sapir College, so that we could envision a situation where some of the employment areas could be built together. And this is a very, very serious plan. It was uh, constructed by one of the world's leading architects, Chris Chow, and um, Seeing it here presented to the audience uh, gives me great hope and pleasure, and I salute the people who, Imad and, and others that were, were showing it. It's, uh, it gives, gives us great hope that something like that is at least in people's brains before it becomes a reality. Um, I'd like to thank um, um, Saeed uh, Abu Hamu. Uh, the uh, Swedish ambassador, the Jordanians, uh, members of parliaments, uh, the Israeli ambassador uh, who was uh, to Jordan, who was gracious enough to greet me here, um, ma many mayors and, uh, uh, from Israel, from Jordan, um, Palestinians. Uh, it's a real honor and pleasure to be here. Um, what I'm presenting to you here now is actually a presentation that was given uh, together with leading Jordanian figures and um, Egyptian figures and with Palestinians. We gave that this presentation that we built both to prominent members of the Arab League. Uh, we created the Middle East Task Force is the in the International Parliamentary Union and we gave this presentation in Geneva. And there's actually 13 countries in this region that are committed to work on the converging interests of countries around the region. Um, and we wanted to give it here with a special focus on, on this region uh, right here. So in the Middle East, and there's many security people here, for many years, We've all been looking at, at each other through the lens of a gun. And one of the things that we're saying, there's other major considerations like security, like economy, like agriculture, um, like business, like technology. And it's time that we broaden our perspective. Um, a lot of times when you talk about the conflict, you talk about where people tear each other apart. And you're not talking enough about the converging interests of different countries in the region because things are happening. And we always hear about what it is that we have to give up, but seldom do we hear what it is that we can receive in return in a big way. And I guess this conference gives us the right kind of emphasis of those things that we can be discussing. So there are many regional interests. There are military interest, economic interest, national interest, security interest, 
um, that we could be cooperating on. Let me just say this. Many people divided the region into Arabs against Jews. I think a new division is required between extremists and those moderate countries and organizations and people that want to live their lives and build their societies that are willing to stand up against them. If you look at Iran, Iran is a threshold nuclear state, whether, you're, whether you like it or not. Whether you're for it or not, it gives us great worry in Israel and some of the other countries in the region. But it's not only a threshold nuclear state, it's also using proxy military warfare in Lebanon, in Syria, which affects this region in a great deal, in Yemen, sometimes in the military faction of the Hamas in Gaza. And in addition to that, we all need to look at one additional factor. With the lifting of the sanctions, Iran is receiving the largest, greatest level of investments from the international community that the region ever saw. From France, from Russia, from Germany, from Italy, now the US, many other countries. Some people may think it's a good idea because they will think that Iran will come to be part of the region. And some people may be very worried about it. But we, the countries that are standing somewhat on the other side, we need to get our act together. Because otherwise, all the money will flow to one direction. And none of the money will be coming to the other direction. And I think it's very difficult for countries to work on their own. Now, our region is dry. Let's face it. It's not just an issue of water, but it's an issue of commerce, and it's an issue of cooperation. It's an issue of prosperity. And the one thing about extremism, it doesn't always need to conquer countries. It comes in through poverty, in the back door. And so if we don't work together in order to set a different agenda, we will be a region that people will write off in terms of their economic investment instead of putting it on the front page of their annual report when it comes to the investments they're going to make next year. I come from the startup nation in Israel. I was born in Kibbutz Na'an. I grew up in Na'an, Kalmyer, in the Galilee, and in the city of Jerusalem. And um, I, um, I work with the, mayor, the legendary mayor, Teddy Kollek. And um, I set up in Jerusalem, this is the old Mint building. What I'm talking about is not just talks. You know, politicians love to talk. Very few politicians know how to do anything in order to create jobs and prosperity. That's the reality. My generation created a lot of jobs in the new economy in Israel, not with the government, but with the international community. The government was sometimes helpful. The first project that I created was in the old train station in Jerusalem. At the most difficult time of the Intifada, the second Intifada, when I had a problem sending my daughters to school, because I was worried that when they get on the bus, maybe they won't get off the bus. When we were thinking three times before we went into a restaurant, it was a difficult time in Jerusalem. But and many people talked about the security measures that need to be taken, and security measures were taken. But the people who transformed the cities were people from the civil society, leaders in business, leaders in commerce, leaders in the hotel business. We got up to do something together. We took the old train station, and we turned it into the biggest thriving technology incubator in the country with performing arts, with the biggest social project in Jerusalem for underprivileged kids, both Jewish and Arab kids, which are now getting 25,000 have passed the matriculation examination, either the Jordanians or the Israelis, and have gone on to colleges or universities. And we gave the city a new hope. My fund 
We manage, no, I created it from nothing. We manage 1.3 billion. I personally, in my own fund, created 120 companies, and we had about nine, 29 exits, primarily on NASDAQ. So we knew, we understood how to create a new economy in Israel when the economy was old. It was an international economy, and most of what we've been doing is win-win. And it's time that we not only do things with the U.S. and with North America, with North America, with South America, with Asia, with Europe. It's time that we do things here in our own region. It's time that we work in ways, certain ways, together. In Jerusalem, in the last 15 years, you know, in Tel Aviv, they look down on Jerusalem. They say, "Oh." We are very strong in Tel Aviv, Herzliya, Tel Aviv. Jerusalem, oh, people go to pray there. We created 37,000 new technology jobs in the city in the last 15 years. In the, medical, uh, in the medical section, half of the employers are Arabs and half are Jews. You know that half of the staff in the medical field are Arabs, whether they be doctors, nurses, researchers. When an Israeli comes to, in, uh, in, in Jerusalem, that's the case. You don't, like, you don't like what I'm saying? In Jerusalem, that's exactly the case. In Hadassah, in Sharet Tzedek, it's exactly the case. And so, um, so the coexistence, it's not always easy. There's a lot of people who like to put a big stress on the tensions between the people, but sometimes things are actually working. Be'er Sheva, 2011. We created in 2012, it actually, then we put it. Our firm put the first, the Be'er Sheva is a city down south. It's a city that didn't always have, it had a, built a great university and it had a great historical story, but not always current technology story. And we created the first cybersecurity incubator for the country. And this is the way it looked like in 2011. This is the way it looks like now. There's 2,200 cybersecurity employees in Beersheba, around which are another 3,500 small businesses, academic services, social services. It's a new energy. And the same thing could be done in other places. We are talking right now on creating seven new regions of economic excellence that are not necessarily just in Tel Aviv, around the country. A lot of which are in close cooperation between Jews and Arabs, whether it's in the Galilee or whether it's other regions. And we are open to this. And right now we want to expand this idea and move with this concept to the region. We call it the power of Yalla. Yalla is an Arabic word which is very powerful, but we use it in Hebrew too. It means, let's move with the blessing of God. Or more colloquially, let's move. And um, what we are talking about is reminding everyone that before there were countries, there were strong cities in the region. These are historic cities that the world tells the history by some of these cities. They were very powerful. And what we're talking about is 10 ideas, 10 cities, 10 ideas, 10 projects, could be 20. We just like the word 10 because Moses, who saw the land, had 10 commandments. So we took 10. But it could be any number that we can start working on, not necessarily Arab, Israeli, Jordanian, Israeli, Palestinian, Israeli, but regionally, and start cooperating on some interesting things. So. First of all, everybody talks about the startup nation in Israel, right? How much technology? Not a lot of people are talking about startup rising, which is technology in the Arab world, in different capitals, in Amman, in Cairo, in Casablanca, in Dubai, in Istanbul, in uh, Ramallah. In Ramallah, there's actually a lot of multinational companies that are now operating. So people from the technology world understand each other. They are entrepreneurs understand each other. They can cooperate. They don't need to wait for governments to move. They can start working on projects. We have an incubator that I set up when I was still an entrepreneur called Taquin. 
in Haifa, which is Arab applications for uh, Arab language applications with with, uh, with 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 people who are Arab speakers that are big ideas. The second thing is really related to what we're doing here, which is really uh, water energy initiatives in the region, and. What you are talking about here in the Jordan uh, River, the kind of goals that you have are very inspiring. Because what you're talking about is, first of all, cleaning up the Jordan, which means cleaning up the sewage that flows into the Jordan, uh, sometimes from the west or from the east, uh, by creating several water treatment facilities that will clean up the water from flowing. The second phase, or as we do this, we need to clean up what's already there. And some of it could be in BOT models. Some of it could be in models where the governments or the World Bank or the USAID or some of the other organizations could provide incentives for companies or for uh, governmental projects to take it on. Because once we clean up the Jordan River, it becomes not only an environmental haven, but it becomes a tourist attraction that is second to none. And it's not long ago, it's a, as long as 100 years ago, that the basin was a lot cleaner, that people came here in a big way, that people came to see what's happening here. And that would give, I think it's up to us, because I see mayors here, like Idan and others that are mayors from this region, that I know are ready to act. I know that there are mayors on the Jordanian side and, uh, and the Palestinian side that are ready to act. It's time for us to work together and to put it into an economic, well-defined project. And Gidon and his colleagues, I think, are setting the way and we would like to follow, but with real, tangible projects that could be done. Um, you know, solar energy, in five years, in five years, Technology that's now developed in Israel and some of the other places by the large, and, and is used more and more by the large companies like Engie and others, solar energy and alternative energy would be half of natural gas. I know Israel is obsessed with natural gas because we just found one. Half of the cost of natural gas. It's going to be revolutionary. Technology is coming into solar energy and it's going to enable the cost of energy to be so much lower than what we know today. There are major initiatives and companies around the world that are willing to come in with the right kind of assistance and help from the World Bank and some other organizations. They're willing to put projects that are together and we could use those and there's some major multinational German companies, French companies, um, American companies, that we'd like to invite together to the region and perhaps to have a few projects to demonstrate. In Aqaba, you know, the project already exists where water is being desalinated from the Red Sea and fresh water are flowing into the Jordanian Arava and into the Israeli Arava in a way that is very symbolic and very important. Too small, but a, but a good first step. Crop strategy. You know, in the Arava, they were growing pickles and, not pickles, uh, uh, peppers. No peppers. Peppers. Okay. And the peppers, you know, yellow peppers, uh, red peppers, green peppers, they were sold to Russia. And the ruble collapsed. And so you couldn't make any money selling um, peppers anymore. Well, in the Arava in the last two years, they came up with a strategy with a few new crops, but three of them I thought were very interesting. One is cucumbers that are very long and very healthy. Two is melons that people who are diabetic can eat, so very sweet melons that are good for diabetic people. But I love the third crop, beans that do not cause gas after you eat them. <laughs> How many family dinners we can have a lot better time with the tea after dinner? So I think that these kind of strategies are exactly 
the kind of things that we need to do knowledge sharing around because the region is changing in terms of water, in terms of rain, and we need good crop strategy. You know, there's a, a bunch of projects around Jordan and Israel with respect to employment zones. Most of these employment zones right now are boring. You have very low cost manufacturing, and you have things that are not very interesting. Jordan is interested in taking some of its agricultural products to the international and selling it in the international community. The Palestinians are interested in it as well. In two weeks from now, I'm in Turkey, and we have some very, I, I, I think the people may have spoke about this, there's a big project between Jenin and Gilboa, the people are th taking 250 acres in Jenin, 250 acres in Gilboa. If we can create a three-way, a three-way, this is, this is like the Jordan Valley, but I took some, some more um, greenery. If we can take a three-way initiative between Israel, the Palestinian Authority, and Jordan, and create a, a set of projects that will have agriculture, basic industry, and with an access to the port in Haifa. I know that Yonayab is here, or was here, and I know how important it is to him. But it's also very important to you know, the three authorities, and I think that this is the kind of things that we can create qualified industrial zones around, where three, well, the three of uh, Israel, the Jordanians, the Palestinians could, could enjoy. And by the way, this, this, this creates something that people can believe in. But what I'm calling for is, you know, Michleret Emeka Yarden, or Emek um, Israel College, or one of the Jordanian colleges, or one of the colleges in, uh, in, uh, in Jenin, which is the American college. Maybe in the new employment zone, we can have some faculties of cooperation with students, so we make it a little bit more interesting. With banks, so that we can work on commerce. With things that people could meet uh, when they need to meet in the region. I think that's the vision that we need to work on. Cybersecurity. You know, a lot of people are talking about large security projects, but today, many of the extreme organizations or the rogue countries are attacking through cybersecurity. Israel is creating a CERT. That, that first of all protects the civilian aspects like um, airports, like um, utility companies, like energy companies. And re just recently, a major energy company in the region of a big country was attacked actually by Iran. And there was a strategy to protect the 40,000 computers that were attacked so that oil production can continue. And this was done in cooperation. And so protecting the civilians from technology attacks on major civilian ops is a big issue that we can work on together. And of course, there's many other uh, projects that we can talk about. Um, the Gaza project that we saw here earlier, I think, is one of the most interesting projects that people should look at. Um, and we need the international community to stand behind it. We Israelis need some sort of guarantee that when cement and when steel and when um, products are sent to Gaza, they will go into building the civil society rather than building uh, strategic attacks against Israel. And I think that if we can find a way to do this in a way that's a win-win, I think a lot of mayors here are very much for it because the sewage that goes into the Sea of Ashkelon is polluting everybody's water, whether you're Palestinian or Israeli. And so what we're saying, all of this is in the framework that my party is leading, that others are leading, that we heard almost all parties in the House of a two-state solution. It is an Israeli interest, it is a Palestinian interest, and it is a regional interest. And this is something, you know, when I presented the plan originally, I presented it with a few generals, but also with Yuval Rabin, the son of Yitzhak Rabin. I come from a party that its major big leader, the last big leader, paid with his life to take bold steps politically. I think today there's a majority to go for a two-state in the Israeli parliament, even though it doesn't always look that way. 
I think there's a majority, even though there's some sense of despair sometimes among people, but I think that um, we should not always wait just for political leaders, or we shouldn't wait for the governments, we should start acting now. Just like on economic development, we started acting now. And it's true that the Israeli and Palestinians should be at the core, but if the Israeli and the Palestinians should get assistance on economic development, on security issues, then it needs a bigger table to create a bigger deal. And I think that even in Israel, there's a big majority, whether you're on the right or on the left, to working openly with the region. And what we say, there's a new generation, there's some new ideas, there's new generation of leadership across the region. And what we say is, yalla, let's go. Thank you. Yalla.